Six years ago, I set foot in the North Cascade mountain range of Chilliwack, BC for the first time and I saw something unique and special. And I had a vision for what this could become. And it took moving here and a global pandemic to finally be able to make this a reality. Desire to do something along these lines started 2014. And that was the first time I set foot in the region and got a sense of what was here. And through looking over maps, I started to wonder if it was possible to do a big mountain effort that linked up peaks of the Chilliwack River Valley. Over the mountains, I see the moon, so it begins. Looking to I was limited in my ability to get to the area to, to explore and piece it all together. But every time I left the region after being here for a day, I had a longing, truly, in my heart of like how beautiful the area was and how it was really speaking to me, these North Cascade Mountains being a little bit different than the Coast Mountains. My name is Gary Robbins, and I'm a mountain trail-based athlete. I'm a mount... <laughs> my name is Gary Robbins, and I'm a trail and mountain runner based in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Good night. Oh my goodness. Oh. Eventually, my wife and I moved to Chilliwack, bought a house a year and a half ago. Oh, you'd be good for grandma. And then the idea grew right. new roots as to something that was going to be a long term project for me, backyard project. I'd never seen anybody link some of the individual sections together at all, let alone the route in its entirety. So this map, which was released in 2009 and has not seen any updates since, is still the most accurate piece of information I've been able to find with a lot of what I'm doing out here. That's what I've been up against, a decade of lack of updated information. Thankfully, this still holds a lot of the keys to the puzzle, but um, it's been a long journey just to figure out how it all links together, and I'm excited that we finally did, that it did. I had no idea if it was going to link the way that I wanted it to. But uh, yeah, this map in particular has been a key part of that process. So I'm excited to get after it tomorrow, tonight, in an hour. Got to get changed. <laughs> One of the things we were the most impressed about moving, relocating to Chilliwack a year and a half ago is the trail access. The, the network here is exceptional. There are a lot of dedicated people and organizations that do incredible work in, in the region. And that was one of the attractants that we had to Chilliwack in general. And there's only five main locations that I can receive help, uh, receive aid throughout. And then every bag is packed with everything I feel that I'm gonna need at that point. Everything's in here, prepackaged, ready to go. I direct events in the summer. It's my busiest time of year. All right, let's do this. So it was going to be a multi-year project to figure this out, but my events all had to be shelved because of COVID. And now this region is directly in my backyard. Uh, the start and finish point ended up being a 15 minute drive from my front door. And I dedicated myself this summer in attempting to piece together what was available to me and how it might be possible to do a hundred-ish mile effort with 30,000-ish feet of climbing and descent. And then I set off to establish what linkages were available and none of this information was readily available. It was a, it was a passion project that took almost every day of the entire summer to establish it was possible. And yeah, so this stuff is over there. It wasn't like I spent a day looking over maps and was like, here's my route. I had a rough guesstimate of how I wanted to do this. Then I had to get out there and actually link them together. And I did that with friends, I did it solo. And it took months to actually establish that the lines that were popping up on different maps, different services, still existed, were at least minimally maintained, and was something where at mile 80 it was going to be safe for me and potentially others to cross these paths. Today is a scouting day. I'm trying to piece together the link between Crossover, Slessy, and McFarland. This is the crux of the route. Came down and around and I've made my way across this spire right here. And now I've got to continue up. And I'm not entirely certain. I think I go around to the right and I believe that might be Crossover that we go around. Uh, it looks super sketchy from afar, and then you step into it and, it, and it reveals itself as you go. Apparently there's another line off McFarland in this direction, 
And uh, I don't think I need to add that in at this point. I wanted to have the established GPS data because I wanted to know the distance, elevation profile that we were looking at. I think we might just stay here tonight. <laughs> and then working back from there, I had to structure my timing so that I started at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. I had two technical mountain passes and those needed to be done in daylight, which meant starting by running 50 kilometers through the night to then hit the first alpine region for as close to sunrise as possible. This Close. bag is everything. Clothes, poles, okay. uh, everything is pre-packaged for each mile. So this is the one that you will ask for while we're on the highway? So this, yeah. So every aid station, this needs to... The route starts and finishes at Cultus Lake. And essentially, for simplicity, it goes Cultus Lake to Chilliwack Lake via the easiest line, and it goes Chilliwack Lake to Cultus Lake via the hardest line. I was saying to Linda that it's not every day that you know you're about to experience something that you'll never forget for the rest of your life. And it's very special when you have those days to know going into it, no matter what happens, I'll never forget today. And so many days just we glaze through and glaze past and you, you don't, they don't mean anything or enough. And it's really special to know going into this for the rest of my days, I'll never forget whatever happens. <laughs> for the next, hopefully, 32 hours to get back to this dock at the end of 105 miles in Chilliwack. So I'm ridiculously excited that we get to do this right now. <sighs> we good? They're gonna drive past and kick us out now anyways. Reese, you ready to go? 10, 9, 8, 7, Five, four, three, two, one, start. All right, here we go. See you guys in the yeah, Had two friends running with me on different stretches and it's 50 kilometers to uh, Chilliwack Lake. I gave myself a conservative estimate of six or six and a half hours. I didn't want to go out too hard. And as it turned out, I felt good and it was faster than I thought it would be. So when I arrived at my first support point where friends were, were there with food and fluids and, and a warm vehicle, I was almost an hour ahead of my estimate. And my next crew that were joining me were sleeping. So my own botching of the time estimates right away just had me, had me waiting almost an hour for my friends to show up for exactly when I asked them to. All right, we've made it to Chilliwack Lake. 50 kilometers to get to here. And now we're gonna turn around and head back to Cultus. Unfortunately, it's about 110 kilometers back, if not 120. Um, the climbing to get to here was 3,700 feet meaning I still have over 30,000 feet to climb on the way back. But hey, we made it to Chilliwack and now we're heading back to Cultus. <laughs> My team shows up and we head out and the goal is to get to the first mountain pass for sunrise. And I just wasn't clicking. Things weren't feeling right. And as we started our first climb, internalizing this before I finally turned to my friend Jeff and said, Jeff, I've got to vocalize this, but I think I'm gonna puke. Somehow it felt like I had chosen the wrong weekend, my body and mind weren't ready for it, and it was all falling apart. And then, all of a sudden, I just started violently puking on the side of the trail. And I don't puke, I don't get sick. This has only happened once previously and I've got almost 20 of these distances under my belt. So I was slogging along and it was really difficult to believe at that point in time that this was gonna be doable. Uh, <clears throat> feeling like hopefully get the worst out of the way early and just keep plowing away until the sun comes up and hopefully I can start eating soon because I lost all my food and yeah, it's not, these things happen, but uh, I've never had that happen, especially that early. 
So we'll keep pushing away and then hopefully by the time we get to the Alpine, the sun comes up, the light comes out and I'm hoping to start feeling normal again. So I got that out of my system and just put my head down and wanted to ensure that we still got into the Alpine onto this pass as close to sunrise as possible. And we finally crested onto our first mountain pass just after sunrise. And though I was in Struggle City and really not feeling great, the sunrise, the day, could not have been any more beautiful. And I was doing everything I could to draw motivation and inspiration from that moment to not allow the negative thoughts to, to weave their way in and prevent me from staying dedicated to the goal of completing this route no matter what it was gonna take. And we finally broke out into the Alpine and were greeted with one of the most magnificent mountain sunrises that I've ever had the great pleasure of experiencing. And I was stuck in this dichotomy of wanting to lay down and go to bed for hours and then also wanting to appreciate how fortunate we were to be there and how great everything else was lining up for us on this particular weekend with the weather window and having my friends there to support me to allow for this to take place. And then we start picking our way across this alpine terrain, which isn't a trail as much as it's just mountain navigation. And we had scouted this route less than a month earlier and it had changed entirely just from the regression of snow in the, in the area. And because we now knew the line that we needed to follow, it actually ended up being more efficient than I thought it could have been. And we kind of knocked out that section pretty consistently even with the fact that I was still focusing on trying to replenish these calories and trying to get my body back to kind of 100% efficiency again. But we got through that alpine stretch in, in a pretty good time frame, considering the hiccups, the bumps that we had faced just prior to sunrise. In ultra running in general, I mean, you're going to suffer when you decide to do things like this. But what's really special is if you can suffer in beautiful places. Ooh, pretty nice up here. Nearing the top of the first of four big climbs. We had that in spades. I knew that this was a, an exceptional area and I was able to draw so much external motivation from the landscape around me. Woo! <laughs> there was a desire to move through these mountains despite how I was feeling in that moment. <laughs> oh, finally starting to come around a little bit. This is the best I've felt in hours. Got a little bit of food in and and we're, we're traversing, so it's not like a high exertion pace. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy. That was a struggle. That was not a fun thing to go through early, and I hope that's the end of it. Oh, oh. Here 
Christ, dude. Okay, thanks, man. I'm gonna go around. You okay? Yeah, and I know better. That was a dumb thing. I mean, I saw, I saw the. We're going down this spine, across that rock gully, and right where it looks impassable because of how steep the drop off is, right in that corner is where we have to go. And I was concerned there might still be some snow there, and none of that snow has seen sun, so it's sheer ice right now. So we brought spikes with us just in case, but I can see from here that we're not gonna have to step on snow, we won't have to use the spikes. But yeah, we'll go down this spine, across here, and then we drop right down here and, and back out, and then start all over on the next climb. You know, we're flushed with opportunity here in BC. We have one of the most diverse and incredible trail networks anywhere in the world. And it's all too easy to take it for granted. Your local trail organization needs funding, they need work, they need man, women power, boots on the ground. Um, show up and, and be a part of the solution. Uh, ensure that we as a, as a community in British Columbia, 10 years from now, are still celebrating how incredible our trail access is and that we don't find ourselves with the opposite outcome of trails being overrun and not maintained. Easy. Trails saved me. Trails presented me with something I didn't have before. They presented me with a motivation to be an outdoor person. And I want that for other people. I want other people to have the opportunity to get out in the mountains and find something that's really meaningful for them and that, that might inspire them to make a life change. Okay. This is the only reason that I am a fit individual is because the mountains and the trails speak to me and they got me moving. Wow. Oh wow, these flowers. The paintbrush is just glowing right now. How are you feeling, Gary? I feel like I make bad decisions in my life. Stomach settled a bit, but still struggling to stay on top of calories. But it's a beautiful day. No complaints to get to spend a beautiful day out in the mountains with good friends. That's the ridge we came down. Down that ridge right there, across right here, and then only a thousand meters, 3,000 feet of descent left to go on this one. Hey bear! Whoop! Yep. Ow. And then there's this 4,000 foot, 1,200 meter straight down descent into a bit of a bushwhack on an old overgrown service road. But we knew, I knew, that certainly I was going to see my crew once we got through this. And that really buoyed the spirits. I had gotten over the first of these four mountain challenges. And even with having the stomach issues and not feeling 100%, we weren't that far off the goal time at this point. Coming up on 12 hours. In a couple of minutes, 43.43 miles. 9,500 feet. A lot of fatigue. The beautiful mountains and lots more to come. <clears throat> we met up with our crew and then got to basically sit down and take 20 or 30 minutes to regroup. So no more sausages. And just focus on getting the calories back in. But yeah, that and then, oh, watermelon. Yeah. <laughs> because at that point, it's a game you can't win if you're not getting the food into your body to fuel yourself to get through the next mountain pass. Taters are going down. Yeah, it's like, I'm gonna be here longer than I 
wanted to be, but I got here 30 minutes before I thought I would be, so I'm gonna take advantage of being a little bit ahead of schedule. It's most important right now to find a way to get calories in and to let them digest so that they don't come back out. Um, and hopefully this watermelon, potatoes, Coke, if I can get all that in and it sits, then I think I'll be able to actually start feeling better on the next stretch. Um, <clears throat> wasn't able to get many calories in after the puke fest, so I've been pretty low on calories for about the last three hours, maybe four hours. 46 here, I'm confident it'll hold until the first leg and we'll reassess there. I felt like I was forced to conserve energy by just not being able to move very rapidly through the terrain with how I was feeling. And I kind of blazed the next section of service roads feeling incredible. And it was a, one of those nice reminders of you're going to go through highs and lows through a distance like this. If you're lucky, the hardest miles come late. But you're gonna get hard miles no matter what, and sometimes when they come early, it just presents a different challenge. So I felt like I had rounded the corner, was firing on all cylinders, and then joined up with, with Jeff and Sam for the next linkage. We are going up towards Slessy, and the Slessy Memorial site, where there was a very historic plane crash. And just before you get to the memorial plaque, there is something called Crossover Pass. And if you go into Crossover Pass, you can get up to the subalpine, and then it's, there's nothing. There's no markings or idea of where to go. So I first scouted it from the opposite direction, where we're gonna end up on McFarland, and tried to go up and over Crossover Peak, but couldn't make it go. And then I came back on this side on another scouting mission, went towards Crossover Peak and Pass from this side, and I thought I had an idea, but it still seemed far too complex and dangerous. And then I decided to open the oldest and only trail map. And it turns out I was going too high and you need to go to 1700 meters and then drop down. And there's a huge cliff wall and you can, there's just this one tiny little chicane down, down climb, not technical. And you end up right there. That's crossover peak. And the snow line below crossover is where we're going to right now. And we'll go across the, under the snow line between these two knobs and then over to Mount McFarlane. And it is glorious up there. I know you can go up all of these mountains on one side, but can you go down them on the other side? And that was the exploration for me where there was no established route. There was no established knowledge. And I was fully expecting there to be a blockade at some point of this route up this mountain doesn't go over. Look at this masterpiece. This is incredible how accurate they were able to drop this tree across the river. This was done to create this bridge. That is clearly someone that worked in the logging industry for a very long time. Boom, dropped it perfectly and then built up this, like, this bridge is one of the most beautiful bridges I've seen across a river anywhere. There was a mishmash of information available and I ended up having to use dated information, maps that are a decade old. The motocross guys would know X and the mountain bike guys and gals would know Y and the hikers would know Z. But that shared knowledge base of how it would all link together wasn't readily available and that's where the research became the hardest part of the project. was an element of off trail and navigation and talus slopes and there's some complexity to the line that I established but it couldn't be something that was too dangerous that would be preventative knowing I was going to be covering some of these areas with 50 miles on my legs you can't subject yourself then to a region that needs you know a hundred percent of your energy and focus This was one of the main areas that I really had to spend a lot of time scouting in advance 
to establish what's the safest way to do this with myself being that far into things and then guiding my friends through that terrain where they haven't seen it before either. That's Williams Peak. This is Rexford over here. The spire, the conical one is Williams. And this is the Shiam range, the whole thing out here. Another project in the future happening over there. <laughs> So we get to the crux of the route as it would be, and we have to down climb this one little area into these big talus slopes and the, and the glacial area. And once we get to the pocket glacier that we have to cover to cross, we kind of took a couple of attempts at things and they just seemed like they were a bit more exposed or dangerous than we wanted them to be. So we ditched a little bit of time there while prioritizing our safety and the best way across these slopes. I, I might just be missing it, but I think once we get through this little thing that you're on, it goes. And once we finally got across, at that point it was just a mountain kind of slog to link together what is below Crossover Peak over to the next peak on the line, which would be McFarland. So when you're crossing technical mountain terrain like this, it can be different on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I was experiencing on the day of the run was different than what I had seen a week prior and a month prior. Yeah, this is um, not feeling familiar. I think we should do the same. Sometimes having snow can make things safer and easier, and sometimes it can be the opposite. So you have to assess on the fly as to what is the path of least resistance and the safest route to get across. There's no established, this is the best way through. It's what is the best way through for this specific date with the conditions that we're being presented with right now. Now we're going from Crossover Peak over to McFarlane, and we're going from what is the one area of the entire line that you're guaranteed not to see anybody into the next area, which is the busiest trail of the entire route. Oh, well, it's pretty nice. So it was this juxtaposition of being on exposed mountain terrain and feeling like it was very wild, very remote, to then coming up to McFarland from a different angle entirely than people are accustomed to seeing. And you could see it was busy, it was a beautiful Saturday, and so many people thought we were lost or thought we were off trail and just didn't know what we were doing. And it was, again, like such an interesting uh, juxtaposition between where we were coming from and where we were going to. But also, the second that we stepped off of that route and onto trail, for me, felt like a huge point in the run where now everything from here to the finish is on an established trail or service road. And we've got the crux of the route behind us. We've done it at the right time of day. We didn't have any major issues and certainly not a gimme from there on out but the hard part is done. So we come down from McFarland, down Upper Pierce Lake, Lower Pierce Lake, and to the Pierce Lake Trailhead in the parking lot. It's a huge descent. It really takes it out of your body. And doing that by itself can leave you sore for days. So I was very conservative coming down and knew that I had to be from the start. And we arrive in, again, this busy parking lot. And my crew and friends were there, and I was behind schedule a little bit at that point. Well, they all went home. <laughs> But it did feel like we, again, had accomplished something and we're at that point, that tipping point of like, well, no matter what, I'm going to be able to get in from here. You look great. Oh, you're having so much fun, I can tell. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. A lot of the question marks about completing it had been removed and now it was just a matter of how long it was going to take to get from there into the finish. 
And what was really nice about the way this project came together was I had so many great friends that shared in it with me. It never felt like a solo project. It always felt like I had great people there that were going to make this more special than it ever could have been independently. We're taking the road for just for like a mile and a half and then we hop onto a service road. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Good to see you, Elaine. Bye, Sadie. Have fun. I'm see you soon. So we left the parking lot there and then started up Mount McGuire. Pizza, pizza. This is why we run. <laughs> and I was able to do that with a different person now. My friend Amory Madden had joined me. All right. This looks interesting. That's one way to f up your ankle. <laughs> so now I'm running with a good friend that I haven't seen in a while and the stories just started to flow and the and the time just started to evaporate. Before we knew it, the headlamps were on, we were in the dark, and we were starting up the third of the big mountains. But once I got on our headlamp again, once we started into this, I again started to feel off. Are you feeling as bad as last night? No, but... And before I knew it, my vision felt like it was a little bit blurry, and I turned to Anne-Marie and I said, I think I'm gonna get sick. I can't believe this is happening again, but I feel like I'm doing everything right, and something's not clicking, and then it just, <laughs> boom. Before I had a chance to react, I was, uh, I was once again losing all of my calories, my hard-earned calories, all over the side of the trail. So we got to the top of McGuire at, I think it was almost exactly midnight. It was a crystal clear night. It was late August, but definitely very cold up top. McGuire! Woo! But the peaks around us were illuminated perfectly in the night. Five miles, 22,000 feet, 25 hours. And we could see Mount Baker. We could see Canadian Border Peak. We could see... Welch and Foley and it was this ridiculous view and in the opposite direction you could see the lights from the Fraser Valley. Yeah, don't take a wrong step. <laughs> don't lose your balance. No. And uh, Fraser Valley. First so it was really uh, something to see the wild terrain that we were on and to see civilization just kind of not that far away from us. So we're coming down off McGuire on the service road. I'm fading badly. We need water. We finally get to a water source. Anne Marie goes to filter some water for us and I hit the deck and I just like, I, I'm just gonna close my eyes while she's doing this. 90 seconds later, she shows up and she says, why don't I give you five minutes for a nap? And I kindly accepted. Four minutes and 45 seconds later, I stood up to start going and she says, how did you know? I set an alarm, you still have 15 seconds left to go. And I said, it's not my first rodeo, Anne-Marie. It's not my first rodeo. And we were off and moving again. And then shortly after that, we did arrive at the aid station. And at that point I needed a proper break. So we decided to take an hour to regroup. Would anyone have an objection to me taking like a 35 minute nap? <laughs> that was Is great. That? Is Gary moving okay? Yeah, like not too bad. The logging road on the way down. It's kind of never ending. And we were walking more than jogging. So it takes a long time when you're walking. So the crew let me sleep for 45 minutes. I didn't sleep for much of it, but it was nice to take a break. I needed that reset. And I was focused on getting calories in before going again. Watermelon in your hand. At this point, the only thing I could digest and keep down was miso soup, salted chips, watermelon, and Coke. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's see if we can break 48 hours. Doing great. <laughs> so much of ultra running and, and long distance uh, pursuits like this is really just troubleshooting as you go, figuring out what's working and what's not working, and trying to problem solve. You're improvising on the fly. It's like things are not working. There's uncertainty when you go into it as to when your favorite foods will expire for you. You work with what you've got. And this was, on that particular day, that's what was solving the problem for me. 
I headed out on the next stretch with my friend Sam drove and we had to run a service road for a bit to get to the eventual climb. And then I started having foot issues. And this was of concern because I've been dealing with these foot issues for a while. And I started to worry that this was it. This was the breaking point for my, my Band-Aid tape solution on my foot. We stopped, we tried to fix it, we started again. We stopped a second time, we tried to fix it, we started again. And finally on the third time, we dissected that what was happening is the tape on my foot while I had slept had heated up in the sleeping bag and created a sticking point with an additional toe on my foot and it created a biomechanical breakdown. So when we figured out what was going on, we simply re-taped over this area, got my foot back to a point where it worked again, and then we went about business as usual for the next climb, and I just was struggling to turn over my feet. It's rocky terrain, it didn't feel safe to really run too much, so we power hiked as much as we could and wanted to get to that aid station and get some calories in again and then try to put in a push to the finish. So we're just set up here on the fire service road waiting for Gary and Sam to come over uh, Windy Knob. We've got everything set up for him and waiting. We've got iced tea and Coke and some of the food that he's been able to get down, like um, avocado rolls, Snickers bars, and watermelon. And we basically power hiked our way to find the crew and it was such a fun experience at that point because my time was irrelevant. And I said that going in and I had a ballpark time I wanted to accomplish, but it was nice for this not to be a competitive thing as much as establishing a line and then wanting to complete the distance no matter what. So there was no pressure with the fact that I was slightly behind my anticipated arrival times. And it was a celebration to see my friends and to know that we were now so close to having completed this. The four big climbs were done and dusted and now the outcome was a foregone conclusion. Look at four just getting this done. Jesus. Um, miso soup. Yeah. And then I need to change out so I wanna do change out my clothes. <laughs> I think there's still 12 hours of daylight, Jack. We sat down, we enjoyed some miso soup. We had a laugh. It was beautiful. It was a sunny Sunday morning at this point. Oh, what's happening? Oh, adventure. <laughs> like I'm talking about it like it's done. I still have 10 miles to go. This is good and the rice in there is good too. So I got some calories in, I got some miso soup in, and then I stood up and I looked at Sam and I said, Sam, I've got to put music on. It's 15 miles to go to the finish and I feel like if I can just flick that switch in my mind, we can close this out a heck of a lot faster than we're going to if I keep walking. She said that was fine. I popped on some horrible dance music, cranked the volume, and I departed that aid station and I was a different person, like a 1,000% different person than when I arrived. And all of a sudden, we were blazing down this service road at insane speeds compared to what I'd been moving. My final 15 miles of this run was my fastest 15 mile stretch by a country mile compared to anything else. And it was because I knew I could let loose now. I knew that I had gotten through the main challenges and, and I could unleash what I had left. And even if I started to get a blister or this, that, or the other thing, I was close enough to the finish that I could be reckless in my attempt to get there as rapidly as I could. There's cold in there already. How's he doing? He's doing good, he's moving awesome. Yeah. So, just uh, trying to keep up on that downhill. Just smell the finish line, it's just like, burn is there, trying to get it all done. It's been a long outing. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. No Have water, coke, and some food, and we're going to see you at the finish. Very, very soon. So we go through one more support point, where I see Jeff and Jeff, and then Sam and I are into the final climb, and from the where we top out there, it's almost entirely downhill to the finish. And once we crested, I had a surge of adrenaline overcome me like I haven't experienced in years, and I started sprinting from there to the finish. And Sam didn't know what was about to happen, and she blinked, and I was gone. 
and it took me, because the music was in, a couple of minutes to shoulder check and realize I had just dropped my friend in an area they'd never been before. So I now wanted to close this out as quick as I could. I knew Sam would understand. So what I did was I collected some sticks along the trail for the one intersection that I would get to where she might not know the direction and I created a stick arrow at the intersection. And I descended that stretch faster than anybody had before. It was the fastest des descent of International Ridge from that intersecting point. And as I got near the bottom, Jeff Pelletier was standing there with his camera and I just looked at him and waved my finger and was like, turn around and start moving because I am not slowing down right now. I am getting this thing finished. Let's go. When I crested that last climb and had that surge of adrenaline, I had to stop myself from becoming emotional. I had to stop myself. I had to fight back tears. I still had a bit of distance to cover, but it was a foregone conclusion. It was inevitable that not only was I going to get this done, but I was going to get it done in a time and a manner that I was, I was proud of. He's moving. Every few minutes I started to well up with the thought of what I was doing and how I was completing this six year journey and having all these incredible people show up to support me and it was it was mine. It was entirely mine. I dreamt it up. I made it happen. I put the time in and I had something that I was never going to get from a race. I had a route that I figured out and then I went out and ran it with some of the best people I know in my life. While I was closing this out, I, I also went through the last few years of my ultra running career. I'm 43 as I'm running this, and for the last two years I've had injury issues, and I've just been up against it with trying to get back to doing this and, and maintaining what I love to do and I had three stress fractures and I had a doctor tell me to give up and I had all these things, these reasons to just believe it might be done and here I was completing something that not eight, nine months prior seemed like it would never happen, seemed like it would be impossible to accomplish and it just felt like a victory on so many levels to to, to be able to continue to do what I love to do the most as someone who's closing in on his mid 40s. And it doesn't matter what my time ends up being. It doesn't matter what all these in, insignificant details are. It was everything I dreamt it could and would be. And then I showed up at Cultus Lake. <laughs> My wife is there, my five-year-old child is there, my friends are there. It was a beautiful late August Sunday morning at the lake and I just sprinted down the down the deck and did a cannonball into the water and it was like the most fun finish I've ever had to any hundred mile effort. And and there it was. It was it was more than I ever thought it could be. And uh, I'll I'll cherish this forever. This this is this is more rewarding for me uh, and more special for me than than most of the belt buckles that I've collected over the years.
Chilliwack was very much an unknown. A lot of people wondered why we moved to the region and had no idea of the fact that there would be not only trail and mountain access, but that it could actually be better than Squamish. It could be better than what people are used to. Certainly, a percentage of the local population probably wants to maintain that secret status of what's here. Whereas I look at it much like what Squamish, where Squamish was 20 years ago, and how Squamish has evolved into much of, more of a tourism destination and much more of a trail culture. If I think it forward 10, 15 years, we can and will, I think, end up with a, an internationally famous area. And I think a lot of positives can come with that. And certainly, the counter to that is that increased traffic and you need more resources and you need more funding. And all I'm aware of all of that, I agree with all of that. And my hope is really that if I can assist in establishing what's here, we can see more passionate outdoor people relocating to the area and we can influence a groundswell movement that provides financial support, that finds government funding. If this was ever to become a known route, it could see some maintenance on there that could make it something really special. Whether you want to run it continually, hike it over five or six days, it is absolutely world-class terrain from start to finish. Don't tell anybody how incredible it is here. Chilliwack sucks. Tell your friends. <laughs>